Hey, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me for another True Stream. Praise God. It's good to be back. I missed last week. Uh, just, you know, something came up. Just didn't have my voice to be able to, uh, you know, share with you. So I just thought I'd take a break. And, uh, but I'm glad to be here back with you today. So thank you again for joining me. Um, no new announcements this week. Uh, you might check out Susie's teaching for the month of July uh, that she is on uh, Fridays, I believe. And uh, you can check that out. And also um, uh, still looking for uh, setting a date for this fall for uh, another Healing Journeys Today conference. And uh, we're all excited about it, looking forward to it. The last one was just an awesome success. And uh, I mean, as uh, success, not in just the terms of number of people that came, but just what was ministered in the, in the fruit that it produced and is still producing uh, today. So uh, just wonderful. And uh, so let's see here. Um, I think that's it with the announcements. Once again, my name is Mike Hesch. I'm with Healing Journeys today. And the topic I have for us today is driving out the symptoms. And I got that title uh, because of uh, something I want to go over with us uh, today. I think it's very important. You know, uh, I'm going to go back a little ways into the Old Testament. You know, everything that God recorded in the Old Testament was uh, written for our example. And those examples remain today for us in our life. And His Spirit gives us application to how those things apply to us today. And it's uh, very important uh, that, you know, consider the whole New Testament that we have today written by those men uh, who the Spirit spoke through, they had all their references in the what we call the Old Testament. In other words, their revelation of Jesus Christ was through the Old Testament. And, you know, we have that same revelation available to us today. So, you know, there's a camp, a certain group of people that just disregard the Old Testament. They throw it out as being legalistic and having no application for today. But, you know, uh, I disagree, and I think Jesus disagrees as well. Uh, think about it. Jesus uh, was everything that he was to us and is to us today because he fulfilled the Old Testament. And as I just mentioned, the writers of the New Testament receive revelation from the Spirit of God through the Old Testament as to the identity, not only of Jesus Christ, but who they were now in Christ. And so, very important, these, uh, let, let me read this. This is good. <clears throat> I remember I ran across this years ago, and I thought, you know what? This is an important statement that we should remember about all the Word of God. You know, this is in Romans chapter 4, just very quickly. I'm not going to spend a lot of time here, but it says, uh, it's talking about how Abraham, that God made a promise to Abraham for the seed uh, to come out of him and Sarah. And it goes on to say that he wasn't weak in faith. He didn't consider his own body. Uh, he didn't look at the symptoms. He didn't judge God's faithfulness by his personal experience in the sense what he was feeling, hearing, smelling, touching, or tasting. But he simply went by the word that God gave him, and that word fully persuaded him. Uh, he mixed he mixed what God said with his faith, and that caused him to be fully persuaded. But this is what I want to read. It goes on to say, and it says, verse 21, and being fully persuaded that what he, God, had promised, he, God, was able also to perform. And therefore, it was imputed to Abraham for righteousness. You know, he believed God, and it was counted unto righteousness. Now listen to what this verse says. It says, Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us also to whom it shall be imputed if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. You know what that's saying? That is saying that if this was only 
if that promise, if that's what was written, was only available to Abraham, only to him, it would not be recorded in this word. Think about that for a second. The testimony, the, the record that we have in the word that we have today, and might I point out, this is in the New Testament, was written and recorded, which means it's for us also. So you have to ask the question, uh, is, is God going to bring forth Isaac through me or through my, me and my wife? No, that's not, the, that's not the point that's being made. The point that's being made here that uh, Paul is drawing on by the Holy Spirit to teach and instruct us how to walk in the newness of life that we have received through the Spirit of God, through the Spirit of Christ who is risen, is the example of faith, the example of hope, the example of being steadfast, the example of being fully persuaded. And we can look at his life and we can learn from that life, how to walk in those victories that God has prepared for us in Christ on this side of the cross. How important that is. So important. So I, I wanted to bring that out because, you know, uh, it, it's sad, but I encounter it too often. And uh, that is people, when you start talking about the Old Testament and ah, that's types and shadows, let's talk about Jesus. Well, folks, I am talking about Jesus because you cannot separate Jesus from the Word. He is all the Word, not just the Word you want to talk about. Amen? He is all the Word. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. So important. Anyway, I want to start in, uh, I'm going to Hebrews chapter 4, and I'm going to read a few verses here uh, pertaining to the topic, which is driving out the symptoms. It says, uh, verse 1, it says, Let us therefore fear, lest the promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. While the heart of the writer here uh, is expressing the way our Father feels towards us. He's saying, son, daughter, I don't want you to miss out on anything that I have provided for you in my son. So listen up. Give your attention to me. Reminds me of Proverbs 4, where it says, My son, give attention to my words. Stretch out your ear to hear what I'm saying. Don't take your eyes off of it. That's exactly what this, this is being written here. He said, Let us fear, therefore, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed in with faith in them that heard it. Do you know, the words that I'm speaking unto you today, they are spirit and they are life. And if you'll hear those words and mix them with the capacity that you have for faith, then they're going to be able to produce the harvest that is in them. But if you don't mix them with your own faith, if you don't become steadfast on the words that you're hearing, uh, if you're not applying, letting the Spirit quicken to you how that applies to you, and then mixing it with your own faith, in other words, where you're saying, yes, that's written to me. Yes, that is written for me. Yes, this is what Jesus has accomplished for me, and you let your heart connect to that, when you do so, that is going to release the harvest that is in those truths. It's a law that God set up. Now, what hindered these people from uh, embracing the, the gospel that was preached unto them? First of all, you might say, well, what was the gospel preached unto them? Well, Consider that just like us, the children of Israel were in bondage. How were they in bondage? Well, they were in bondage to Egypt. Now, Egypt was a type and a shadow of a, the spiritual darkness in this world. And the Bible says that we were dead in our trespasses and sins, that we were, that we were owned by the devil, that we were his slaves. And it says that we were in captivity 
uh, to him. But when Christ came, he came to set us free. He came to set the captives free. Now, God used a deliverer, and his name was Moses. And God worked, his spirit worked through Moses to bring deliverance from the physical bondage that they had in Egypt. And he was going to bring them out to a land that he had already provided for them. This is such a key point. See, God made that promise to Abraham. He said, the land you're on right now, well, you're really not going to own it, uh, but it's your land. I'm giving it to you. It belongs to you. And one day you will have it, but you're going to die before you actually have, take possession of it. You're going to live in it. You're going to enjoy the fruits of it, but it's really not going to be your land, uh, but your children are going to inherit it. Now, he made that promise to him that that land was his land. And Abraham lived in it as if it was his land. He enjoyed all the bounty and all the benefits and all the fruits of that land. And he lived an abundant life in that land. And <clears throat> But it wasn't his yet. But there was coming a time which he prophesied unto Abraham that the children, his children, would come out and they would take possession of that land. So God had already set it aside for them, but he also, as I've mentioned many times before, God also wasn't just forsaking the people that were presently living in the land when Abraham was there. Because God loved them and wanted them to experience him and his goodness, he gave them, even though their hearts were hardened against him, he told Abraham, you know what, I'm going to give them an extra 400 years. And uh, he says, you know what, I know they're not going to change, but I'm going to give them that anyway. They, they might, there might be some people, but, you know, as a whole, they're not going to. So in God's loving kindness, he gave them that opportunity. So the point I'm making is that these children were given a promise of what was available to them when they were in Egypt. When Moses came, he said, God's going to bring you out into a land flowing with milk and honey. And there you're going to raise your children. You're going to raise your cattle. You're going to inhabit houses that you didn't build. You're going to possess lands that you didn't work for, crops that you didn't plant. Uh, you're going to inherit all this because that's God's plan for you. Okay? Now, it was an exciting message. When they were in Egypt, they were very delighted to hear that. But as soon as trouble came, they forsook that promise and they, oh, no, we, well, we're better off here. Let's not go, you know, let's not go any further. They murmured and they complained all along the way. And so they heard the gospel, the good news, that God had something better prepared for them. But yet they didn't mix it with their faith. They didn't say, oh, okay, so this is going to be our land. Once we move in there, all that's going to belong to us. They didn't keep going back to the promise that God gave them. Let me read on. In verse 3, it says, For we which have believed do enter into rest. As he said, I have sworn in my wrath if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise, and God did rest the seventh day from all his works. And in this place again, if they shall enter into my rest. You know what this is saying is God, on the seventh day he rested because he knew there was nothing else required to complete his plan. Not one thing was left for him to do. Now, there was many things that would take place in the future, but he had already made provision in his plan from the beginning that allowed him to rest, that if they do this, then this is what's going to happen. If they don't do that, then this won't happen. So God set that up from the very beginning. So God wasn't constantly trying to change his plan, getting change orders you know, from the, uh, from the builder on what to do now. Nope. When he drew up the plans it was complete. When he stamped approved on it, that meant there wasn't one modification necessary. It was complete. And so he was able to rest. Now, he made the same promise to the children of Israel concerning the land. 
He said, look, I have this land for you. It's a wonderful land. I've picked it out myself for you. It's the best land of all there is. And, and it has everything that you'll ever need to flourish, to have an abundant life. I've picked it out for you. You're going to love it. It's great. Yeah, right now there's a bunch of people in the land that don't belong there. But once you drive them out, they won't be a problem to you anymore. But you got to drive them out. You don't have to do it of your own strength or your own power. I'll be right there with you. I'll be your strength. I'll be uh, your power. I'm going to go before you and put the fear of me in these people where they'll, that you won't have to lift a finger. They're just going to run out when they see you coming. They're going to be so afraid of you. So God made them all these promises. It's called good news. The gospel, he preached this gospel unto them. I have a great thing for you that I've prepared for you. And he said, so all you have to do is just rest in what I tell you. When something comes up, I'll give you direction. And I'm going to make sure that you inherit this land that I've promised for you. I'll do all the lifting. I'll do all the heavy work. I'll do all the fighting. But you just have to cooperate with me, okay? That's what he told them. Folks, that's good news. That, that is awesome news. But they wouldn't mix it with their faith. And you know, each time that a problem came up and they didn't respond in faith, it says that it hardened their hearts. Yeah, it hardened their hearts. Let's read on here in verse 6. It says, Seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein. And they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. See, whenever we resist the good news, there's, there is a fruit to resisting. And that fruit is it creates a hardness in our heart. And it also produces unbelief. In other words, when we, we'll talk about the opposite of that. Whenever we accept what God says and our heart goes all in on it. In other words, we mix our faith with that and say, yes, God said it. It's true. I can stand on it and rest there. When our heart enters into that place of confidence, it does uh, two things. It builds our heart in belief, and it produces a fruit of being fully persuaded that we read earlier. And it strengthens our resolve to stand even when trouble comes against us, okay? Now, the, the opposite, when we reject the good news that God is bringing to us, the opposite of that happens. In other words, we become strengthened in fear and uncertainty. We become strengthened in unbelief. And our heart becomes hard against the things of God because when we don't receive it, we're like, well, God said and it didn't happen. But we leave out the very, the most important variable. And that is God is not going to impose his will on us. He's provided it for us to choose of our own free will. And he encourages us. He shows us. He teaches us. He explains to us and lets us know all the benefits of what his, he's provided for us, but yet he still leaves the decision to us. I mean, we all know the scripture, I set before you this day life, death, blessing, and cursing. And he even encourages us which one to pick. He says, choose life that you might live. Choose the blessing that you might live the abundant life. That's our Father's heart for us. But here it says that there is still some of us that need to enter into this rest, which means if we're not entered into rest, that means there's still unbelief present. Now we have the same excuses that the children of Israel had. But they're different in this respect. The children of Israel had the Canaanites, the Hivites, the Gergesites, the Jebusites, the Philistines. He, they had all those people in the land. And they looked and they could see their enemies. They could see that they were big, that they were uh, giant, that they were 
defense. They had weapons. They, they looked and they saw all of that. Now you say, well, we don't have that today. Well, folks, yes, we do. We have symptoms in our body. You know, God never gave us any physical real estate like he did the children of Israel. They actually had a physical piece of property. But we have something that is a property, and it's a property that belongs to the Lord. And just like the land of Israel belonged to God and the children, so this property belongs to us and our Father. And, and the inhabitants in this land that we need to drive out, they might not have the name Canaanite or Gergesite or Jebusite, but they have names like fear. They have names like cancer. They have names like, uh, you know, arthritis or you name it. You, you list the list. Uh, and those are the enemies. Those are the inhabitants that should not be in this land. Amen? And we should say, we should say what God says about this land. Uh, let me read on. It says, uh, verse 7, And again, he limited the certain day in David, saying, Today, after so long a time, as it is said, Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. For if, and this is an incorrect translation, it should, should, should say Joshua, because Joshua took the children of Israel into the promised land. It says, for if Joshua had given them rest, then would he, David, not have afterwards have spoken of another day. See, David spoke in Psalms uh, 95, David spoke this scripture where it says, today, if you will hear his voice, Harden not your hearts, as in the provocation in the wilderness. And then in verse 9, it says, There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. You know, we're those people it's talking about. And what is keeping us from resting? It's not necessarily the inhabitants in the land. It's, it's what our heart has chosen to embrace about what God has said. You know, Think about this. Go back with me to Numbers. Numbers chapter 14. You know, this is, uh, uh, this is when Israel first went out and they are traveling. This is in the second year. They have come out of Egypt. Uh, the Egyptians have long been drowned. God has provided for them for these two years. And uh, now they're sending out these spies to look at the land, to see and to, uh, I don't know if this is the right word, but to like uh, confirm or verify and take some uh, fruit of the land and show the people this is what God has promised and this is what we're actually seeing. So he sent these spies into the land and he picked elders out of the group. And they sent in and they spied out the land for 40 days. They spied that land out. And they came back and they said, wow, it is a good land. Uh, listen to verse 27 in uh, Numbers 13. It says, and they told him and said, we came unto the land whither thou sentest, and surely it floweth with milk and honey, and this is the fruit of it. Now, the fruit they're talking about was they had... Uh, picked some grapes to share with the people. <laughs> and get this, this is how fruitful the land was. They had to carry one cluster of grape between two men. Okay, now that is a big cluster of grapes. Okay, it wasn't just one long bead of grapes. It was a cluster big enough that it required two men to carry it between them. Okay. Now, think about that. It was everything and more than they imagined. And these spies confirmed that. But what else did the spies say? Did they magnify uh, what God had said to them? Or listen to what they said, verse 28. Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land, and the cities are walled and very great. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak there, and the Amalekites dwell in the land 
of the south and the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and by the coast of Jordan. And Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and possess it for we are well able to overcome it. Look at the contrast there. Part of the group is saying, oh, oh man, they've got some big people there. Ooh, it, they got bull walled cities and they're everywhere, you know, and we're just these little people. Listen to what they went on to say. But the men that went up with Caleb and Joshua said, we be not able to go against the people for they are stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we have gone to search is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof, and all, that we peop all the people that we saw in it were men of great stature. And there were giants, the sons of Anak, uh, which come of the giants, and we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. So listen to what the people saw. They didn't look at what God said about the land, and they didn't value or esteem or exalt what God said about the land. They exalted what they could see with their eyes, their senses. That's what they exalted. Now, they didn't exalt what the good things they saw with their eyes, the promise of God, but they exalted the things that the enemy spoke to them about the devil who was speaking to them, telling them, you can't get that land. You're little. Look how small you are. You, you, that land just eats up people. If it ate up people, then why was it producing so much? Why was it sustaining all those people if it wasn't a good land? You know, God had prepared that land for the children of Israel. He did, wasn't going to send them into a desert and say, well, let's start planting. No. He had prepared that land for them so that when they got there, the harvest, the bounty would all be theirs. But did they look at that? No. They looked at the trouble. They looked at the people. They, they instead of looking at them as Caleb did through the eyes of what he'd already seen God fulfill, they looked at it through the eyes of the present circumstance. The moment that they saw the, the giants, they trembled in their boots. You know, folks, I've had this happen so many times to me where something will come into my life. It could be a symptom in my body. It could be a circumstance in my life where immediately it comes and it doesn't look good. It doesn't look good to the natural mind. And the enemy's right there telling me about what all bad is going to happen because that has come into my life. But do you know, not one time has my father ever forsaken me. He's always brought a voice into my mind and heart, just like he did here with Caleb and Joshua. He's always brought a voice along with the trouble that says, you can do it. You have the victory. Jesus has overcome that. Christ is in you. He always gives me an encouraging word and assures me of the victory that he's already provided for me. He always comes. Every time I can say my father has been faithful 1,000% of the time in doing that for me. Now, in that moment, I have an option. I can either accept what God has told me about what I have seen and what I have felt in my body, or I can listen to what the enemy's telling me about those things. Now, every time that I go with that voice of Joshua or that voice of Caleb, I've always, 100% of the time, seen the victory. But each time that I've let that other voice be greater than the voice of Joshua or the Spirit of God, we could say, in my life, I've had to fight, I've had to battle, I've had to resist, I've had to struggle, 
every time, bar none. So because I'm not really fast, but I'm, I am diligent, <laughs> I've, I finally figured out after so many years of that, that you know what? I'm not going to go with that first voice I hear about what I see. I'm going to go with the voice of my father. And I'm going to stand on that voice no matter what I see, feel, hear, smell, touch, or taste. You know, that's what happened here. Listen, listen to this. Th this is good. I'm going to read on. We know the story, but I love hearing it over and over again. It says, in all the children, verse 2 of chapter 14, uh, I'll start in verse 1, and all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried, and the people wept that night. And all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron. And the whole congregation said unto, and unto them, Would God we had died in the land of Egypt, or would God we had died in this wilderness? Listen to what they were saying. They get, they get 10 people who tell them, we can't get into the land, but yet they have seen with their own eyes the power of the Almighty God manifested in their life. And what do they choose? They choose the grumblers and the complainers. Then they forget all about how God parted a Red Sea and destroyed a, the largest, strongest army known to mankind at that time. God destroyed them in one second like that. He just closed the, the water on them, and they were gone forever. See, they forgot about that. See, the devil's never going to remind you about the victory that you've had in Christ because God has given that to you and given you the freedom to stir that up in you. God might bring it back to your remembrance, but you need to stir up your minds by way of remembrance. That's what Paul, I mean, uh, Peter admonishes us. Stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance. That's how we stir ourselves up. That's how you drive out the symptoms in the land. You don't focus on them. You don't magnify them. You don't say, wow, they're bigger today than they were yesterday. You can if you want, but that's only going to strengthen them. That's only going to weaken you and strengthen them. But what did, what did, listen to this commentary here. It's beautiful. They go on and they murmur and complain. I'm not going to read that. It says in verse uh, five, and Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the children of Israel. And Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, which were with them that searched the land, they rent their clothes and they spake unto all the company of the children of Israel, saying, The land which we pass through to search, it is an exceeding good land. And if the Lord delight in us, then he will bring us into that land and give it us, a land which floweth with milk and honey. Honey, only rebel you not against the Lord, neither fear the people of the land, for they are bred for us. Their defense is departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Fear them not. Wow. Folks, you know, this attitude that Joshua and Caleb had was agreement with God. Even though circumstances didn't look good, their agreement with God, uh, what would you say, uh, invigorated them to inspire those around them. We can get this land. God promised it to us. It's a beautiful land. It's nothing like those 10 said that we're not going to be eaten up. Their defense is departed from them. You know, folks, the power in symptoms that are in your body, disease, the, the power isn't in the physical part of them. That was destroyed in Christ Jesus. The power that's behind them that keeps them there and keeps them in your mind and heart strengthened is the inhabitant in your land. And it's not the symptom. It's the lie about the symptom. It is the fear, the doubt, the uncertainty, the voice of the enemy. What the doctors have said, what the diagnosis was, what the pictures looked like. 
Those are the things that have strengthened the symptoms in your land. And that's exactly what happened here. The enemy spoke to the children of Israel and defeated them, the majority, without ever having to battle one battle against them because they believed his lie. And when they believed his lie, what happened? Well, they entered into cooperation with the enemy. Or you could put it like we read in, in Hebrews 4, they're un, they, they didn't mix with faith what God said. They mixed their faith with what the enemy said. And what did it produce? Unbelief. And what did that unbelief do? It hardened their heart against the victory that God had for them to the point where they wanted to turn around and go back to Egypt, a land that God had completely destroyed. <laughs> I mean, it's like it's not a, a tough decision, folks. It's like, do we want to go where God has presented and made available to us the victory that we have in Christ? Or do we want to go back to the old defeated life of what the enemy brought into our life? Defeat, failure, frustration, anger, uh, all the things that the enemy has provided. Not to mention sickness, disease. You can name the whole list. But the sickness and disease are a result of us believing the lie of the enemy. So what happened to the Israelites? Well, none of those people that rejected the promise entered into the land. They never had to fight one battle, and they were already defeated. Okay? The two that went into the land went in strong, Joshua and Caleb. And they battled, all right, but they battled knowing that the victory was theirs. Joshua said, uh, when not Joshua, Caleb said when he was 80 years old, he said, my strength is the same as it was the day I spied out the land. Give me my land. And Joshua said, go get it. It's yours. Listen to what God told uh, Joshua here. In Joshua chapter one, it's also he also spoke it to uh, Moses the same thing, but I just thought of Joshua here. Joshua chapter one it says, uh, verse one. Now after the death of Moses the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, Moses my servant is dead. Now, therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, thou and all this people, unto the land which I do give to them and the children of Israel. Listen carefully. Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread, that have I given unto you, as I said unto Moses. Okay, listen carefully. God said, I've given you all this land but only the part that you tread on, that the sole of your foot walks on, that land will be yours. See, that's the promise that God made to him. And he even describes the borders and the boundaries of all that land that's available to him. He didn't promise any land outside those boundaries. Now, we've been promised a land in Christ Jesus, and that is that we would possess this land that we've been given, you know, that you were born with, your body. And God has promised that when you receive Christ into that land, that you have a potential for victory to take all of that land. And whatever you tread on is going to be yours. But you have to make that decision. So you have to decide to mix your faith with the good news each time that it's presented to you. That's a choice that you and I make. Listen to what he tells uh, Joshua here. He says, um, Only be strong and very courageous, that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded thee. Don't turn from it to the right or to the left, that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, 
that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then, for then shalt thou make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Now listen carefully. This is God speaking, and he says, Haven't I commanded you? Be strong and of a good courage. Be not afraid, neither be dismayed. For Jehovah, your God, is with you whithersoever you goest. God just reminded him, hey, look, I'm the one who made this promise to you, and I'm the one who's with you to fulfill it. So you can be strong and of a good courage, because I'm the one telling you. Do you know this same promise is for us today? We may not use the book of the law in the sense that um, Joshua understood it, but we can surely say the word of God. You know, uh, uh, listen to this. This is in Isaiah, many, 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 many years after that was written. And listen to how God expressed the same principle, the very same point to Isaiah that he ministers unto us today. I'm going to Isaiah 55, I think. Isaiah 55. Um, yeah, listen to this. Verse 10. It says, For as the rain cometh down, and the snow from heaven, and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth, and maketh it bring forth in bud, that it may give seed to the sower, and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it will accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. Wow, this is the exact same point that he said to Joshua. He said, look, I'm the one telling you this. It's my word, and it's and I'm responsible to fulfill it. But you need to cooperate with me. You need to be strong and very courageous on that word. And don't turn to the right or to the left. If it says you can have it, don't turn away. Don't let any obstacle be in your way. Say you can't do that. You stand up to that obstacle and say, you get out of my way. And that's exactly what happened. You know, Joshua did not back down. It's these people, the people that he was leading that didn't take all the land God promised. They, they, they allowed the, they allowed, I'll put it this way for us, they allowed the thoughts of the enemy to remain in their mind. They didn't cast them down. They didn't drive out those thoughts and replace them with what God said. They yielded to those things. Uh, go with me to Deuteronomy 11. God warned them about this. And folks, you know, like I said earlier, what I'm sharing with you is, although uh, I'm sharing with it in parable form, you could say, about the children of Israel, every one of these truths has application to us today. And I'm mixing that in with this, but you have to choose. I have to choose to mix with faith what I'm hearing and saying, you know what? That's as true as it was for the Israelites, for Joshua and Caleb. It's true for me today. Am I trying to get a piece of physical property in the world somewhere? No. But am I trying to possess the land that God has given to me? Yes, I'm, I'm going to possess every inch of this land that God has given to me. But I've got to drive out the inhabitants that are there. Amen? You might say to yourself, yeah, but when I got saved, Jesus drove them all out. Well, that is a true point. But consider this, who let them back in? See, they came back in because there was no opposition against them. And what is the opposition that we've been given to oppose them? It's the same truth that we just read in Isaiah 55. It's the same truth that we read in Joshua chapter 1. It's the same truth that Jesus gave. Jesus said, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. What is the truth? 
Thy word, Jesus said, is truth. So we, we mix with our faith, the capacity we've given to be steadfast by our Father. We use that capacity, we mix it with the word, and we say, I'm not budging off of that. This is what God's word said, and come hell or high water, uh, I ain't budging. Listen to what it says here. I'm in uh, Deuteronomy 12. It says, uh, these are the statutes, the judgments, which you shall observe to do in the land which the Lord God of your fathers giveth thee to possess it all the days that you live upon the earth. Now, we've been given the same thing. God gave us the promise in Christ Jesus. It belongs to us. The provision is there. Uh, through the new birth, we can possess it all. But there's a way that we possess it, and this is according to the word. We must observe the word and walk in the word, or you could say walk after the spirit, and by doing so, we won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. There will be no place for those inhabitants in the land. Okay, listen to what it says. You shall utterly destroy all the places wherein the nations which you shall possess serve their gods. Upon the high mountains, upon the hills, under every green tree, you shall overthrow their altars, break down their pillars, burn their groves with fire. You shall hew down the graven images of their gods and destroy the names of them out of that place. Wow, that's pretty clear. He's saying, don't let anything that those people were doing in the land remain before your eyes. You know, we were told the very same thing when we accepted Christ as our Savior. He said to be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. See, we have to tear down those images. We have to tear down those high places that have been in our mind and our heart that were sown there through the world, through the flesh. And if you're ever going to drive out the symptoms, you got to remove where they're anchored into. You got to uproot their, every root that they have. You, you don't just cut down the grove, you got to uproot the grove. And the way we do that is through the Word of God. That's how you drive out the symptom. You drive out it by pulling it up by the root where it has no place to come back. And we do that through the Word of God. That's the transformation that takes place when we mix with faith what the Word of God says in our own life, where we choose to follow the Spirit over the flesh. Jesus said the flesh profits nothing. It's the Spirit that gives life. The words that He spoke unto us are Spirit and their life. And if we'll sow those into our heart, there is a harvest, folks for us, and that is to reap everything that Christ died and rose again to secure unto us. But again, just like God said to Joshua, I've set the land before you, and as much of it that you're the sole of your foot will tread on, that's what you'll possess. So folks, are you have inhabitants in your land, symptoms in your body? Well, don't allow them to stay there anymore. Take the word, mix your heart with the, the, the faith that God has given you the capacity for. Mix that, your heart, connect it to that word, and that's going to create an immovable force. Like it's, we just read in Isaiah 55, that word will not return unto God void, but will the word go void in your life? It will if you don't tread on it, if you don't walk upon it, if you don't claim it and live in it and dwell in it, you will not receive the benefits of it. Am I speaking a curse over you? No, folks, I'm speaking by experience. I can tell you I've lived both ways. And I know what happens when you don't stand up and stand on what the Word of God says. Listen to, go back to Hebrews for me. I'll wrap it up here. In Hebrews chapter 4, listen to what it says. It says, uh, 
I'll pick it up back in uh, verse 9. It says, There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. For he that is entered into his rest, he also has ceased from his own works as God did from his. In other words, you're, you're no longer trying to fight with your own weapons, with your own ability, but you're resting in the provision that God has made through Jesus Christ. And what provision did he make? Well, let's just pick one, 2 Corinthians 10.5. These are the weapons of our warfare. And the weapons of our warfare are mighty through God to pull down strongholds. So we can be at rest pulling down strongholds. But how do we do that? We bring thoughts captive to the obedience of the word of God. That's how we battle today. That's how we uh, take possession of the land and drive out the inhabitants. Notice what he says. He says, let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. Do you know if you're not capturing thoughts, if you're not looking at the enemy the way God said to look at the enemy, then you're giving place to unbelief in your life. And that unbelief is becoming stronger, not weaker. Whatever you support is what's going to get stronger. Whatever you meditate in is going to be strengthened. So why not do what verse 12 says? Put your focus on the word, for the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any physical weapon that you could have in this world. And it's so powerful that it divides the spiritual from the physical. And it says, it is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Wow, what a powerful way to wrap this up. For him to say, look, the way you labor to enter into the rest is you go to the word and you choose to follow what the word says because that word is going to show you the thoughts and intents of your own heart that the enemy has used to to create a symptom in your land, to create a stronghold in your life. And he's saying, when you see that stronghold in light of the word of God, you're going to see that it can't stand against the word of God. When you mix with your faith what that word says, and you go to battle against that, it can't stand before you. Why? Because Christ has already defeated it. You're you're not trying to get a victory. You're resting in the victory that Christ has worked for you by doing what? By doing what he says, by yielding to the power that's in the weapons that God has given to us. And what is that weapon of our warfare? It's mighty through God. It is his word. Because it's the word that does not return void unto God. So when we yoke up with that word, when we put our faith, our confidence, our trust in that word, folks, you can't be defeated, but I'll tell you what will happen. Those symptoms are going to be driven out. Those strongholds are going to fall like the walls of Jericho. You might have to stay up for more than a day like Joshua had the sun stand still until they had the complete victory. You may you lose a night or two of sleep because you're resting in the power of God and you're standing on his word and you're not giving in. But folks, the land that you're going to inhabit is a good land. It is one that's full of victory and peace and joy and all the fruit of the spirit. And that that fruit of the Spirit is stronger than any lie the devil could ever whisper to you. Father, in Jesus' name, I just thank you that you've given us this victory, that this land is your land. It belongs to you, that it's been bought with a price, and that we, through your word, will glorify you in this land by saying no to the enemy. Father, I thank you for strengthening each and every person listening to this message to stand against the inhabitants in the land, those inhabitants that have encroached on what Jesus Christ has purchased and provided for them. Father, I thank you for stirring your word in them that they will, 
that they will stand on that word, that they will use that word, that weapon of warfare to defeat the strongholds, the thoughts, and watch the inhabitants fade away out of their land. So, Father, I thank you for this good word. And in Jesus' name, I just bless everyone that's heard this, that it would produce the harvest in their life in that God has sent it to produce in Jesus' name. Amen. Awesome, folks. Thanks for joining me today. Look forward to our next time together next week. And until then, God bless you. Have an awesome rest of your week. Thank you.